welcome to part five. I think this is probably second to the last. Maybe it'll be the last. This is uh, this is an interesting point because he's talking about this um, this guy Hubbard, um, James Hubbard, uh, this guy that he had taken in, and he was the son of of a foreman of. Uh, of Jefferson's from a nearby um, plantation that Jefferson also also uh, owned, and he didn't do too well at first. But then he reached the top in terms of efficiency, putting out nails, and acted the model slave. <clears throat> and I'll just reread, uh, overlap the one last paragraph. Then one day in summer of 1805, actually, let me see how long. Ninety-four. So nine years later, when he would have been, you know, 19 or something like that. Okay. Then one day in the summer of 1805, early in Jefferson's second term as president, Hubbard vanished. For years, he had patiently carried out an elaborate deception, pretending to be the loyal, hard-working slave. It's funny, to, if you pretend to be hard-working, that is pretty hard-working. Okay. He had done that hard work not to soften a life in slavery, but to escape it. The clothing was not for show. It was for disguise. Hubbard had been gone for many weeks when the president received a letter from the sheriff of Fairfax County. He had in custody a man named Hubbard who had confessed to being an escaped slave. In his confusion, Hubbard revealed the details of his escape. I'm sorry, in his confession... Hubbard revealed the details of his escape. He had made a deal with Wilson Lilly, son of the overseer Gabriel Lilly, paying him $5 and an overcoat in exchange for false emancipation documents and a travel pass to Washington. But illiteracy was Hubbard's downfall. He did not realize that the documents Wilson Lilly had written were not very persuasive. When Hubbard reached Fairfax County, about 100 miles, I wonder what happened to uh, Wilson Lilly. When Hubbard reached Fairfax County, about 100 miles north of Monticello, the sheriff stopped him, demanding to see his papers. The sheriff, who knew forgeries when he saw them, and arrested Hubbard, also asked Jefferson for a reward because he had run, quote, a great risk arresting, quote, as large a fellow as he is. Change page. No ad. Okay. Hubbard was returned to Monticello. If he received some punishment for his escape, there's no record of it. In fact, it seems that Hubbard was forgiven and regained Jefferson's trust within a year. Jefferson does look like an awfully nice fellow. The October 1806 schedule of work for the nailery shows Hubbard working with the heaviest gauge of rod with a daily output of 15 pounds of nails. That Christmas, Jefferson allowed him to travel from Monticello to Poplar Forest to see his family. Jefferson may have trusted him again, but Bacon remained wary. One day, when Bacon was trying to fill an order for nails, he found that the entire stock of eight penny nails, 300 pounds of nails worth $50, was gone. Of course, they had been stolen. The quote unquote. He immediately suspected James Hubbard and confronted him. But Hubbard denied it powerfully. Bacon ransacked Hubbard's cabin and, quote, every place I could think of, end quote, but came up empty-handed. Despite the lack of evidence, Bacon remained convinced of Hubbard's guilt. He conferred with the white manager of the nailery, Reuben Grady, quote, Let us drop it. He has hid them somewhere, and if we say no more about it, we shall find them. Walking through the woods after a heavy rain, Bacon spotted muddy tracks on the leaves on one side of the path. He followed the tracks to their end, where he found the nails buried in a large box. Immediately, he went up the mountain to inform Jefferson of the discovery and of his certainty that Hubbard was the thief. Jefferson was, quote, very much surprised and felt very badly about it, end quote, because Hubbard, quote, had always been a favorite servant, end quote. Jefferson said he would question Hubbard personally in the next morning when he went on his rural, uh, on his usual ride past Bacon's house. 
When Jefferson showed up the next day, Bacon had Hubbard called in. At the sight of his master, Hubbard burst into tears. Bacon wrote, I never saw any person, white or black, feel as badly as he did when he saw his master. He was mortified and distressed beyond measure. We all had confidence in him. Now his character was gone. Hubbard tearfully begged Jefferson's pardon over and over again, quote, For a slave, burglary was a capital crime. A runaway slave who once broke into Bacon's private storehouse and stole three pieces of bacon and a bag of cornmeal was condemned to hang in Albemarle County. The, govern the governor commuted his sentence and the slave was quote-unquote transported, the legal term for being sold by the state to the Deep South or West Indies. Even Bacon felt moved by Hubbard's plea, quote, I felt very badly myself. But he knew what would come next. Hubbard had to be whipped. So Bacon was astonished when Jefferson turned to him and said, Ah, uh, sir, we can't punish him. He's suffered enough already. That's Jefferson. God. So maybe I was wrong. I mean, Jefferson just so, you know, he just gave this guy every chance. The guy just, yeah, not getting even punished. Wow. Jefferson offered some counsel to Hubbard. Yeah, I, I read the article before, okay. I'm just, that's, it's just, just being a little bit sardonic along the way. Okay, anyway, Jefferson offered some counsel to Hubbard. Don't assume how it's going to turn out. It, it is interesting. I mean, Jefferson's an interesting person. You know, I, I see it as some slave owners like to think of themselves as nice and giving the slaves every chance, and when they do get beaten, well, he gave them every chance. They brought it on themselves. And some like to be, you know, feel mean. Jefferson liked to be a nice guy. Jefferson offered some counsel to Hubbard. Quote, gave him a heap of good advice, end quote, and sent him back to the nailery, where Reuben Grady was waiting, quote, expecting to whip him, end quote. Jefferson's magnanimity seemed to spark a conversion in Hubbard. When he got to the nailery, he told Grady he'd been seeking religion for a long time, but I never, quote, but I never heard anything before that sounded so, or made me feel so, as I did when the master said, go and don't do so anymore, end quote. So now he was, quote, determined to seek religion till I find it. Bacon said, sure enough, he afterwards came to me for a permit to go and be baptized, but that too was deception. On his authorized absences from the plantation to attend church, Hubbard made arrangements for another escape. So, the whole Stockholm Syndrome thing comes from the fact that down there in the near situation, the local situation, it's like, he could have whipped me twice as long becomes a real reality. If I hadn't talked back to him, I wouldn't have gotten beat, right? Now here, Thomas Jefferson's trying to be nice to somebody who knows they deserve freedom. There's only one nice thing to do to that person, and that's give them freedom. And if you're a philosopher on the topic of liberty, held as an expert by history itself and by myself. You are not accepted from these standards that you helped create. Right? You're a lesson. It's an extra part of the lesson realizing these realities. During the holiday season in late 1810, Hubbard vanished again. Documents about Hubbard's escape reveal that Jefferson's plantations were riven with secret networks. Jefferson had at least one spy in the slave community willing to inform on fellow slaves for cash. Jefferson wrote that he, quote, engaged a trusty Negro man of my own and promised him a reward if he could inform us so that Hubbard should be taken, end quote. But the spy could not get anyone to talk. Jefferson wrote that Hubbard, quote, has not been heard of, end quote, but that was not true. A few people had heard of Hubbard's movements. Jefferson could not crack the wall of silence in Monticello, but an informer at Poplar Forest told the overseer that a boatman, belong, below, a boatman belonging to Colonel Randolph aided Hubbard's escape clandestinely very 
carrying him up the James River from Poplar Forest to the area around Monticello. Even though white patrollers of two or three counties were hunting the fugitive. The boatman might have been part of a network that plied the uh, Ravana and James Rivers, smuggling goods and fugitives. Possibly Hubbard tried to make contact with friends around Monticello. Possibly he was planning to flee to the north again. Possibly it was all disinformation planted by Hubbard's friends. At some point, Hubbard headed southwest, not north, across the Blue Ridge. He made his way to the town of Lexington, where he was able to live for over a year as a free man, being in possession of an impeccable manumission document. His description appeared in the Richmond's Inquirer, in the Richmond Inquirer. A nailer by trade of 27 years of age, about six feet high, stout limbs, and strong made of daring demeanor, bold and harsh features, dark complexion, apt to drink freely, and had even furnished himself with money and probably a free pass on a former elopement he attempted to get out of the state northwardly, probably may have taken the same direction now. A year after his escape, Hubbard was spotted in Lexington. Before he could be captured, he took off again, heading further west into the Allegheny Mountains. But Jefferson put a slave tracker on his trail. Cornered and clapped in irons, Hubbard was brought back to Monticello, where Jefferson made an example of him. Quote, I had him severely flogged in the presence of his old companions and committed to jail. Under the lash, Hubbard revealed the details of his escape and the name of an accomplice. He had been able to elude capture by carrying genuine manumission papers he'd bought from a free black man in Albemarle County. Albemarle. The man who provided Hubbard with the papers spent six months in jail. Jefferson sold Hubbard to one of his overseers, and his final fate is not known. Gave him every chance. James Hubbard brought that on himself. Slaves lived as if in an occupied country. As Hubbard discovered, few could outrun the newspaper ads, slave patrols, vigilant sheriffs demanding papers, and slave-catching bounty hunters with their guns and dogs. <coughs> I haven't had anything to smoke today. Maybe I'm not going to smoke at all. But partly it's because of this fog. Oh, the fog been having more trouble breathing now, even though I'm smoking less and less because of that Shantex. The fog comes along, it's like, <sighs> just uh, basically asthma inducing. Okay. Hubbard was brave or desperate enough to try it twice, unmoved by the incentives Jefferson held out to cooperative, diligent, industrious slaves. Let me pause for a second, too, because uh, I was going to make. When I'm done, I'll talk about why I did this, but you know, Gary's, I saw a video of Gary still moaning about my betrayal and whatnot. Um, but like, what's the point? What's the point? The point is talking about consent. See, this is what Jefferson did to get consent out of an unfree person. It's mind fuckery. And this guy wasn't having it. And so in the end, you get beat for wanting your freedom. Fuck you. Okay, so that's the real bottom line. The smiley face guy that's like, I tried to offer you. In 1817, Jefferson's old friend, the revolutionary war hero, Thaddeus Kozuko, Koshukio, Koshizuko, this is one of the things that um, Annette Gordon Reed disagrees with. Um, Henry, what's this guy's name again? Henry Winecheck's uh, characterization of this. Though the facts, she doesn't dispute the facts. It's just like, it's the issue of what it really meant. Oh, there might have been a fact, actually, she brought up. But anyway, um, not about this article. She was critiquing um, Winecheck's book on this subject. So, I don't know. Kosciusko. Kosciusko. Thaddeus Kosciusko. Well, that's what I'll call it. In 1817, Jefferson's old friend, the Revolutionary War hero Thaddeus Kosciusko, died in Switzerland. The Polish nobleman, who had arrived from Europe in 1776 to aid the Americans, left a substantial fortune to Jefferson. Kosciusko bequeathed, bequeathed funds to free Jefferson's slaves and 
purchase land and farming equipment for them to begin a life on their own. In the spring of 1819, Jefferson pondered what to do with the legacy. Kosciusko had made him executor of the will, so Jefferson had a legal duty, as well as a personal obligation to his deceased friend, to carry out the terms of the document. Annette Gordon-Reed says that the reason that Jefferson didn't accept it is because he was in so much debt to other people that it would have exposed him um, to, to having to pay all those people. The terms came as no surprise to Jefferson. He had helped Kosciusko draft the will, which states, quote, I hereby authorize my friend Thomas Jefferson to employ the whole bequest in purchasing Negroes from his own or any others and giving them liberty in my name. Kosciusko's estate was nearly $20,000, the equivalent today of roughly 280000 but Jefferson refused the gift, even though it would have reduced the debt hanging over Monticello while also relieving him in part, at least, of what he himself had described in 1814 as the, quote, moral reproach, end quote, of slavery. Was Jefferson lenient to James Hubbard at first, not just out of, you know, liking him, but understanding he just wanted his freedom, and Jefferson was just trying to break him of that desire, so that, you know, because he's a slave. If Jefferson had accepted the legacy, As much as half of it would have gone, not, in, not to Jefferson, but in effect to his slaves, to the purchase price for land, livestock, equipment, and transportation to establish them in a place such as Illinois or Ohio. Moreover, the slaves most suited for immediate emancipation, Smiths, Coopers, Carpenters, the most skilled farmers, were the very ones whom Jefferson most valued. He also shrank from any public identification with the cause of emancipation. It had long been accepted that slaves were assets that could be seized for debt, but Jefferson turned this around when he used slaves as collateral for a very large loan he had taken out in 1796 from a Dutch banking house in order to rebuild Monticello. He pioneered the monetizing of slaves just as he pioneered the industrialization and diversification of slavery. So, um, maybe this is related to what Annette Gordon Reed was getting at. Legally, he couldn't free his slaves because they were collateral for a debt. Before his refusal of Kuziscu, how did I say I was going to pronounce that? Kuziscu's legacy, as Jefferson mulled over whether to accept the bequest, he had written to one of his plantation managers, quote, A child raised every two years is of more profit than the crop of the best laboring man. In this, as with all other cases, providence has made our duties and our interests coincide perfectly. With respect, therefore, to our women and their children, I must pray you to inculcate upon the overseers that is not their labor, but their increase, which is the first consideration with us. End quote. In the, 19, in the 1790s, as Jefferson was mortgaging his slaves to build Monticello, George Washington was trying to scrape together financing for an emancipation at Mount Vernon, which he finally ordered in his will. He proved that emancipation was not only possible but practical, and he overturned all the Jeffersonian rationalizations. Jefferson insisted that a multiracial society with free black people was impossible, but Washington did not think so. Never did Washington suggest that blacks were inferior or that they should be exiled. It's, cu it's curious that we accept Jefferson as the moral standard of the Founders era, not Washington. Perhaps it is because the father of his country left a somewhat troubling legacy. His emancipation of his slaves stands as not a tribute but a rebuke to his era. And the prevaricators and profiteers of the future and it declares that if you claim to have principles, you must live by them when you die, I guess. And actually, he freed them when Martha died. He said they'll be freed when Martha died, but Martha freed them. So, Martha freed them. After Jefferson's death in 1826, the families of... It's, it's this why this... After Jefferson's death... I don't have anything particular.
particularly against Jefferson. I like him better than uh, plenty other figures, but um, I don't believe in apologia. It was a very great man. No, it's like let's just face reality. It's the best thing that you can expect. After Jefferson's death in 1826, the families of Jefferson's most devoted servants were split apart. Onto the auction block went Caroline Hughes, the nine-year-old daughter of Jefferson's gardener, Wormley Hughes. One family was divided up among eight different buyers, another family among seven buyers. Joseph Fawcett, a Monticello blacksmith, was among the handful of slaves freed in Jefferson's will. But Jefferson left Fawcett's family enslaved. In the six months between Jefferson's death and the auctions of his property, Fawcett tried to strike bargains with families in Charlottesville to purchase his wife and six of his seven children. His oldest child, born ironically in the White House itself, had already been given to Jefferson's grandson. Fawcett found sympathetic buyers for his wife, his son Peter, and two other children, but he watched the auction of three young daughters to different buyers. One of them, 17-year-old Patsy, immediately escaped from her new master, a University of Virginia official. Joseph Fawcett spent 10 years at his anvil and forge, earning the money to buy back his wife and children. By the late 1830s, he had the cash in hand to reclaim Peter, then about 21, but the owner reneged on the deal. Compelled to leave Peter in slavery and having lost three daughters, Joseph and Edith Fawcett departed Charlottesville for Ohio around 1840. Years later, speaking as a free man in Ohio in 1898, Peter, who was 83, would recount that he had never forgotten the moment when he was, quote, put up on the auction block and sold like a horse, end quote. 